Okay, it says we're live now. So these are the awkward moments where we try to uh, wait for people to find out we're on and, um, and not start ahead of time, but... We want to say good morning. We want to say good morning, yes. Thank you. And You're welcome. And I just want to uh, really encourage you to keep doing things like this, tuning in to the scriptures and the teaching of the word. Mm -hmm. uh, life's getting busy for all of us. Uh, we're starting to get back into the flow of just incredibly busy lives and, and multitude of things going on at once. And it's really cool if you're, if you're anchored in Christ solidly. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get in the flow and feel of abundant life, but if you're not anchored uh, solidly, you will start to, to be isolated and lonely and drift and feel like you're, you know, I, uh, sometimes I feel like I just want to crawl up in, in, a, in a tunnel somewhere and just reflect until I get that feeling back again. And this will occur to you over and over again unless you're anchored in Christ. So the way we take on uh, our urban or sprawling urban existence and the hardships that come with it is we stay anchored in Christ. We stay connected to the faith, connected to each other. We go through this, uh, this, this time trusting in the gospel. Uh, we can't become uh, hyper-religious people with our own value of self-righteousness. Uh, we've got to keep serving the Lord and pleasing the Lord. And that means living by the gospel and it means sharing the gospel with others. And it means the hardships of a busy life, of uh, troubles that keep coming and uh, don't stop. So uh, keep uh, tuning in where you can. Uh, we've got, along with this Sunday morning, we've got uh, men's and women's group Monday and Tuesday where we take a longer, broader look at things. And we also encourage each other uh, in the faith as we can, uh, get our prayer requests out and uh, also, Thursday evening, 6.30, uh, Dave Woods, Pastor Dave, is going through the book of Matthew. And, uh, and then all of these uh, live streams are also on our YouTube channel. And we uh, encourage you to subscribe to that and get regular uh, review of things. If you don't have time to, to uh, listen carefully or there's more there than you thought, uh, you can go back and review it. And uh, that's at, at uh, Zoe Church YouTube channel. And you do a search on Zoe Church San Juan, four words, in YouTube. And you will see our little green ball come up, the one that's on this uh, Facebook page. And then subscribe, and you'll be linked into that. Uh, we also have a website for audio at zoechurch.com. One word, Z-O-E-C-H-U-R-C-H.com. Uh, there, is, there are MP3s there of recent sermons, and of Sunday morning at least, and then uh, there's also a PayPal button there if you'd like to contribute. Uh, you don't have to be a member to contribute. If you uh, listen in and tune in for the first time and you enjoy what you hear, remember Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 6, and uh, uh, give generously to those who ring your bell. So um, if you... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is actually. So if you find something uh, beneficial in, uh, in, in the teaching, uh, respond with a blessing and uh, it will propagate the teaching onward. And so we press onward. Uh, so and uh, also I just want to thank, thank all of you who have who've hung with us and uh, stayed in our little community of faith, the, the little flock. Uh, and, and are huddling together through these ways, uh, through this time. And uh, it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of like uh, going through the eye of a needle, but it is getting somewhere. So uh, hang in there, and uh, won't be much longer until the Lord comes back. Methinks so. Uh, well, all that said, uh, I think we've stalled sufficiently now. So uh, I'm going to ask my wife Kathy to open us all with a prayer. Okay, please join me. Lord, this is a sacred time where you've called us on the Lord's Day to meet together, to hear your word, to get closer to you, to know what it is that you're saying to us and who you are, Jesus. 
the living word of God who has life for us today. There's hope in that no matter what we see with our eyes or feel with our feelings. There is hope in today because the sun came up and that means that God is in control of this world. He is the Lord of everything, but we have to make him Lord of our lives if we want to succeed under you, Lord. So I just pray, Lord, that you would give us the picture that I have this morning of remaining under and that being that picture of you and your bright light and uh, just your goodness and being able to stay under that light, growing roots down deep into you, Lord, into the foundation of what your word of life is giving to us. And I just ask that you would help us. Help us to give you our fears, to know that we can put all of our hopes in you and your unfailing love, and that we will make it all the way to when we stand before you face to face. And we don't need to be ashamed because everything that Jesus did will uh, suffice for where we are there in that place with you. Mm -hmm. So we just give you today, we give you our children, our families, loved ones, friends. We give you this world that needs you so desperately, Lord, and we just pray that you would lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Kathy. Let me make a couple of adjustments here get centered up and we'll be on our way going forward uh, okay do this that and the other boy do i have a scripture for you this morning it's found in second thessalonians chapter 2 and it's verses 8 through 14 <clears throat> i'm going to read out of the new living translation then the man of lawlessness will be revealed but the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. As for us, we can't help but thank God for you, dear brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. We are always thankful that God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation, a salvation that came through the Spirit who makes you holy and through your belief in the truth. He called you to salvation when we told you the good news. Now you can share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. One more prayer with me, please. <clears throat> oh, Father, take your word and, and just in, in, envelop us with your truth this morning. I pray that we could uh, look at these things and not venture away from your desire for us to trust in you and believe in the gospel. Your ways are sufficient, Lord. You have sent the way of salvation to us. He has come personally and visited us. And in our response to him this morning, Lord, we, we just want to please you. We want to live our lives serving you and committed to that gospel. Uh, we gratefully thank you for all the blessings and benefits that you brought into our lives. Uh, we just thank you for your abundant graciousness and kindness. And we acknowledge that you pour your blessings out on the just and the unjust. You, you are a good and generous God and many live with the blessings that you poured out. And so, Lord, we, we just want to keep telling of your goodness. We want to keep proclaiming the reality of the truth of how you've come up with this plan to save us and you followed it through all the way up till now. And it's in its uh, final stages when the day of the Lord is, is about to be the final step. And, and we just thank you for putting us in a place in it. And we ask that you would make us effective so teach us out of your word things that you want us to see this morning, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so it's the time of year where uh, uh, earthworms are starting to appear on the pavement and the sidewalk and the concrete. 
And I've noticed them, uh, you know, we had the rain here in Southern California on, I guess it was Friday. And, uh, and so I've been seeing them and I've been retrained in life, which is, which is a good thing. They say you can't te teach an old dog new tricks. Well, I used to search for earthworms in the ground and put them on the end of fishing hooks and uh, catch fish with them, <laughs> plummeting the ground from, uh, from that precious resource. But in recent years, um, I've read and discovered and uh, been schooled in gardening about the value of earthworms and how they enrich the soil and how uh, they're almost universally loved by humans of all perspective, uh, from Charles Darwin to the deepest of uh, faithful believers. Uh, earthworms are seen to be maybe one of the most important uh, organisms alive uh, in the food chain. Uh, you, and you know, you can um, describe the biological, chemical, and, uh, and organic uh, things that they contribute, which are many. And you know, they, they, they channel the ground and they bring uh, nutrients from the top down through their channels, their vertical channels, and deep into the soil and aerates the soil and brings moisture there. And, and, uh, and it, it's just an amazing thing what they contribute. And they also have, a, <laughs> they also have an undesirable life of sorts. Um, you know that uh, almost everything is a predator of earthworms. Okay, not only uh, uh, large animals, bears, uh, all types of uh, uh, mammals, but birds uh, of all types eat earthworms, of course, and beetles and insects and, and, uh, and, and bugs eat earthworms. So the earthworm has this tremendous environment that it has to function in, survive, and then it's prone to diseases inside because of the uh, nutrients that it eats and the things it processes. There's all types of internal things. So these days when I see one of those little worms flapping on the concrete, I, it tells me it's still alive, it's in the wrong place, it needs to be uh, picked up and, and, uh, and, and placed in a, pl in, a, in a location where it will survive. And so um, the other day I picked up one off the, off the middle of my patio, which must be like the Sahara Desert to an earthworm. And, and my immediate task was to find safe passage for it, but that wasn't so easy because you can't just throw it where water is, okay? so. Uh, water isn't what they need. They need soil and they need a particular kind of soil. So I looked around, saw the right spot for it and threw it over to the place where it could have a chance of surviving. And, uh, and that's my reaction to earthworms these days. And, and now that we're seeing them around, it's, uh, it's a reminder of, of uh, a lot of things. Um, our passage this morning from verse 8 to verse 14 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in my estimation, is the wormhole of salvation for the Gentiles. And I'll explain what I mean by that, but this passage is the culmination or the highlight of 1 and 2 Thessalonians. It brings all of the arguments and discussions together. And of course, those thoughts are the reality of the Thessalonians the life that they're living. So in a way, the passage leads you to understand First and Second Thessalonians in the context, and that leads you to understand its place in the book of Acts 17 and 18 uh, chapters uh, that describe the, the mission of Paul to Macedonia and the Thessalonians. And that leads you to understand the Gospels, which is the life of Christ and its meaning and its purpose and the history of redemption. And that leads you to understand the Bible, the bigger picture, the, the meta-narrative of the Scriptures. And so I, I tell you that uh, this passage of Scripture is, is the place where the Gentiles can dig in and find salvation. So... Let me say a word, first of all, about the context here, the style. The style of this passage uh, is similar to apocalyptic style and genre in the book of Revelation. And those of you who have studied Revelation in any depth uh, have probably noticed a familiar pattern with the way uh, in which the author John the Beloved 
uh, explains the terrible unfolding of the apocalyptic events. The f there's a familiar pattern, and that is to tell the outcome first and then follow it by dynamic details as they unfold. So you're never left with just this dramatic horror of the horrible things. You're told first the outcome, and then by going back and forth uh, from a heavenly perspective to an earthly perspective, uh, from chapter 6 to 16, uh, John the Beloved goes through seven seals and seven trumpets and seven bowl judgments, and they are all covered and marched across the stage of history in graphic detail without ever losing sight of the heavenly outcome that it portrays. And so this method of, of outcome first followed by details uh, we find now in the Apostle Paul, in his writings, in his very early writings, perhaps 50, 51 AD. And to me, it's an indicator not that the two men collaborated at all. The writings of, of 2 Thessalonians and Revelation are perhaps 40 years distance between them or more. And, uh, and, and so they didn't talk to each other or, or com compare notes. But they are both inspired by the same spirit of prophecy, the spirit who reveals to us uh, how things are going to unfold, the outcome of all things and the dynamic of them. And so uh, when, when you see, when you look at it this way, uh, the outcome followed by the details, we're able to hold on to the faith and trusting in God that way while considering some of the most disturbing events to ever occur in human history. And so uh, let's dissect our text this morning uh, and slow it down for a second. And I want to tell you that verse 8 is the final outcome, but I want to also point out to you that, uh, that verse 8 happens in the context of the end of verse 7, and the end of verse 7 is the removal of the restraint of uh, what's holding back the revealing of the Antichrist. And we looked at this last time in depth, and, uh, and it's the context. But our, for our purposes this morning, I want you to see that it follows thousands of years of stasis or a relatively stable environment. The workings of lawlessness are occurring in secret, but they are restrained. And now it's been thousands of years since Thessalonians uh, was written, and the Antichrist has not yet been revealed. So we know that the restraint held back the Antichrist for thousands of years. And then that restraint now at the end of verse 7 is mentioned as having uh, come, uh, been taken out of the way. It's personified, the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. But don't think of it as a, as a will. <laughs> it's not the will of a person uh, that does this. Uh, we mentioned uh, last time the preferred understanding that it is, in fact, uh, the, the Roman Empire, the prevailing government of, of uh, human agreement at the time, uh, that will one day be uh, not restraining the man of lawlessness anymore. The, the Roman uh, Empire consisted of uh, an institution of Roman government and a leader, the Roman emperor. And the, between the two of these, you can refer to uh, this restraint as personal and uh, as institutional in the government. And, and so um, as history unfolds, we understand that that man needs to be governed and is governed and government keeps man from his worst impulses. And so when those things are out of the way, then the events of the preceding section happen. A people who together are rebellious. They are rebellious in that they don't want to be governed. They are uh, propelled forward by the removal of the restraint. And also this man of lawlessness now is revealed. Okay, so thousands of years leading up to this. And then the outcome in verse 8 is swift and sudden. Notice how Paul states it. 
The man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. So only a few words between his being revealed and uh, the Lord Jesus killing him, uh, five words perhaps, only five words separate those two uh, realities. And the swiftness of what happens to him uh, is part of why this outcome is supposed to bring us a measure of comfort and acceptability, that we can accept the fact of what God is doing. We can see the wisdom of it. So we might say that this Antichrist uh, uh, person is constrained in time, constrained to a small fragment of time. Now, from the book of Revelation, you might understand that for three and a half years after the Antichrist is revealed, he's allowed to do the things that he's going to do. And people are allowed to uh, follow him and promote him in that way, the way they want to. But three and a half years after 2,000 plus years build up is not an especially long time. And considering that after these uh, five words in the middle of verse 8, eternity follows. The Lord Jesus will reign eternally. So, so you have thousands of years before, three and a half years of this lawlessness uh, man's reign on earth, followed by eternity. Con he is constrained by time. There are only a limited number of, of, uh, of, of issues that are going to be affected by him. And and you might you might see that the that the threat to us is negligible and that the plan of God uh, incorporates the evilness of Satan into the workings of this Antichrist man and judges uh, the work of Satan, the Antichrist and all who follow in a relatively short period of time. So that's the first thing I want you to see is that it's an immediate outcome. The, this is the third time in this section of Scripture that the lawlessness, uh, the man of lawlessness is going to be revealed. It's stated, it's stated three times he's going to be revealed. Verse 3, verse 6, and here in verse 8. So three being the number of, of fullness and completeness here. Uh, he, he is fully revealed, but, in, but for a short period of time. And, uh, and it and it is uh, actually um, uh, told to us uh, that he will be killed with the breath of the mouth of Jesus. Now, this is literally, uh, this can literally be fulfilled by the, by the actual breath of Jesus uh, or the words that come out of the mouth of Jesus spoken uh, through his breath. You might remember the famous uh, incident after Jesus is raised. He breathed on the disciples. His, his breath brings life. But his breath also can bring destruction uh, to his enemies. There's a, a great passage of, of Scripture in Isaiah which, which describes the breath of his mouth. Isaiah 11:4, The earth will shake at the force of his word, and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. And that is just two verses before the serenic picture of the lion lying down with the lamb in peace, the, the turning of weapons to plowshares, the, the millennial reign of, of Christ on earth, the beautiful nature of what he brings in. It will immediately follow this destruction by the breath of his mouth of the Antichrist. So just a, an incredible um, uh, overshadowing of the power of Jesus versus the blasphemous um, belligerence of this, this man of lawlessness that will amaze and impress uh, his, his uh, friends and, and, and intimidate his enemies and, and bully the earth with his presence. And so Jesus can just overshadow him with a breath, just breathe it on him and he's killed. So verse 8, the outcome has two facets uh, in which Jesus destroys uh, the, not only the, um, 
the Antichrist killing him and ending his very life and ending uh, the work that he does. But the second facet of, of the destruction mentioned in verse 8, the outcome, is he destroys him. So all of his following, all of his, the buildup of how powerful he is, is, is destroyed also. There isn't like a remnant, there isn't a cleanup period where things have to be cleaned up and all the destruction has to be, whatever, hauled off. Uh, that not only is he killed, but he is destroyed and overshadowed completely by the splendor of Jesus' coming. His coming is so magnificent it vanishes the thought and the terror of even the three and a half years of Antichrist terror. So you can see now why uh, the scriptures use childbirth oftentimes as an example of suffering followed by something that's not even in the same scale as the suffering. The labor of childbirth followed by the joy of a child is, is just overshadows the labor pains, uh, absolutely. And that's what this is going to be like. So there is something in the text now that we've looked at the in outcome. Uh, there's something in the text here that is maybe hidden to you unless I underscore it for you. But the, the outcome is assured by Jesus coming, the, the parousia, uh, Parousia for the French, or I don't know, for the Greeks, I don't know what that was from, but uh, <laughs> flippant today, but forgive me. So Jesus' coming is the splendor that, that demolishes and destroys the Antichrist following and work and destruction on this earth. But then verse 9 starts to go back through the sweeping description of the dynamics of uh, this Antichrist figure. And it starts out with his parousia, his coming. Remember, the lawlessness uh, uh, principle, the secret of lawlessness, the secret mystery of lawlessness is at work. It's been at work for thousands of years. But the Antichrist will come and be revealed uh, fully at a certain point in time. That's his coming. It is a false coming. It is a false Christ who's coming. But it is a coming nonetheless. It is an appearance. It is a presence among fallen humanity of, of the Antichrist. And, and so the two of these are contrasted now. And so verses 9, uh, 9 and 10, the dynamics of the Antichrist parousia are spelled out. And they are um, really um, insightful to understand. The, the thing that you need to understand at the start of this is that the Antichrist is not just uh, horrible because of his corruption. He is truly corrupt in every way, in every human way. The, the consummate incarnation of human uh, corruption and rebellion against God. But we find out in verse 9 that he is here um, working through the energy of Satan, uh, energeion in, in the Greek. And don't think of it as the work of Satan as a completed work. The, the better understanding of this is that uh, he, he comes doing the workings of Satan. His, the, the principle of the power of Satan is incorporated in this person, in this human being. He is supernatural. He is supernaturally empowered by the counterfeit power of Satan. And that's the thing about the Antichrist that uh, that, that really uh, you need to understand is, that is part of the deceptive power. It's not visible now. He's restrained now. And that when he is revealed at a certain point in history, he will be unleashed uh, with supernatural power that is the workings of Satan. It'll be the best Satan can do. And it's described here in terms of, uh, of might, mighty power, deception. Uh, it's described here uh, in ways that, uh, that, that are rather frightening. <laughs> and, um, and, and they are brought together uh, under, his, under his realm, uh, in, including believing lies that people have, including uh, a, a deception that runs deep. And all of this hinges on the supernatural power that is, that is in him. And so that supernatural power is unleashed 
and he uses every kind of deception to fool those who are on the way of destruction. And I, I told you this last time that the people who follow the Antichrist are not saved people. The rebellion mentioned earlier in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is not a falling away from the faith. These are people who are rebellious already and now they find in the Antichrist the leader they want. Supernatural power, this is the one that's going to lead us uh, out of the boredom of life, out of the hatred that we have for everything and anyone, and into our ultimate victory of ruling and reigning as demigods here on the earth. Uh, this will bring together the rebellious people and the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, and then he will lead them at that point. So this is a perspective that though you might think you see hints of it now, you see dynamics of it now, um, you know, you haven't seen anything yet. When the Antichrist is revealed as having uh, his identity being revealed, he will have these mighty powers, these lying wonders, these, uh, these signs, these things that look like uh, he is in fact God in the flesh. Uh, and that will be the deceptive factor of people who want something like that. They are tired of political movements. They're tired of the frustrations of trying to, to uh, live under the laws of others. They want to break loose and follow this person to salvation, as it were. And it brings together uh, the two of them. So and that's what we have in the dynamics. Uh, there are a lot of things in that passage that... Uh, would would uh, would warrant your um, understanding, but um, the thing that I think is the most important for you is to see in verse ten at the end of verse ten that the people who are deceived, they are ones who refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. Now, in the context of Second Thessalonians, this truth that they refuse to receive. And love is the gospel. It's what Paul spent all of 1 Thessalonians describing. And it is the gospel having come into Thessalonica, the Thessalonians receiving it. They welcomed it. Uh, they let it change their life. They were converted by it. They came to serve and please Jesus uh, because of the gospel. They were put in a place of waiting for him from heaven. They uh, were assured that they would be delivered from the wrath of God because of it. And they received all of that. And, and it says furthermore that they loved it. And you know, I think here's an understanding that you can take away from this. Um, people can hear the truth and acknowledge the truth about things, but it doesn't mean they love the truth. When you love the truth, you are willing to live and obey it you are, willing to, you are willing to do anything for it. And that's the description that Paul made of the gospel to the Thessalonians. They heard his words. They received it from him. They uh, hung on to it. They let it go deep into their lives, change them. They placed their hope in the future upon Jesus coming back from heaven. And they understood that even now they were being delivered from the wrath of God by simply believing the things that they were told. Paul could, Paul could understand that they were the chosen because they believed it, and they were actually being saved because they believed it. And so at the end of verse uh, 10, the people who follow the Antichrist are not living by the gospel. They don't love the truth. They don't love the gospel. By the way, the definite article of, of truth is there, the truth, <clears throat> and agape is also the word for love there. And so they've refused to love the truth and accept the truth because it would save them. So <clears throat> that's the dynamic, the inner frightening dynamic of how this man of lawlessness uh, impacts humanity outside of those who are saved. He gets a tremendous global following because of his satanic deception, because of the supernatural powers that he uh, displays. 
And those people are looking for something other than the gospel for hope to save them, for victory, for domination. And they find it and it's brought together in this man. But notice it's a subsequent state of existence from having rejected the truth. This is the problem with rejecting the gospel and saying, I'm not ready for it yet, maybe later in life, is that it can put you in a state of, of, uh, of being ready for something really bad, that is the, the permanent sealing in of unbelief. In the book of Exodus, we're, we're taken through the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. And you see in the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, his own responsibility for his unbelief. God is, is calling Pharaoh to let his people go, to, to uh, acknowledge that, that Pharaoh is not God, that God is, and that God wants to have a relationship with these people. And Pharaoh waffles and wavers in capriciousness all through the 10 plagues. But in the end, God hardens Pharaoh's heart to where he's now consistently an enemy of God. He's not allowed to be capricious anymore. He's not allowed to say, well, okay, I'll believe it now for a time. He's not allowed to go in and out and back and forth anymore. At a certain point, he is fixed in that place of unbelief. And that's the, that's the description of these people at the end of uh, time, at the end of time as we know it now, who have solidified their interests in an antichrist figure. They are now placing their hopes in that antichrist. They have not accepted fully the gospel. They have not remained uh, in the faith and waiting for Jesus from heaven. They've rejected it as truth. And now they're in a place where there's going to be no turning back because it's, it's now time for the final judgment. So verses uh, 11 and 12 now describe the fate of those who are, uh, who are now locked in this place of unbelief and not responding anymore to God's gospel. In verse 11, God causes them to be greatly deceived and they believe the lies they're being told. They believe them and then they live lives of enjoyment apart from what God is calling them to do, and they end up condemned rather than believing the truth. So that's the hardening of unbelief. That is the final uh, place of, of humanity that rejects the coming of Jesus, uh, rejects hope in the second coming of Christ, rejects the message of the gospel, and follows instead a satanically inspired human being who poses as God on earth, following him will result in the condemnation of those for rejecting the truth. And I hope you can see all of the causes and effects that are here. They're complicated. Uh, God's not responsible for Satan coming in and deceiving people. Uh, God uses Satan as an instrument to finalize something that's already been going on and now is no turning back because history will move on. There are no more cho chosen people at this point. There are no more people who will respond to the gospel. And humanity now will face the wrath of God uh, because it's been planned for ages and eons. So while we see some elements of of hedonism in verse 12, enjoying evil rather than believing the tr truth. We see some examples of, of justice. They'll be condemned for enjoying that evil and rejecting and not believing the truth. Uh, ultimately, this is the resolve and the final, um, uh, final fruits of the coming of the Antichrist. He will come one day, fully, a parousia, here with people, and he will end with uh, destruction. He will be killed by Jesus himself. And the following in humanity that he has will be destroyed by the splendor of Jesus coming. End of verse 8. So now, in verses 13 and 14, we see this, this uh, tremendous uh, fate and outcome of those who were not deceived, those who, like the Thessalonians, believed, accepted the gospel, 
Let it convert them, change them inside to where they're pleasing God rather than rebelling. Uh, let the, uh, the work of the gospel and the, and the um, message of Jesus return be the hope that they're waiting for and, and allow themselves to be delivered from the wrath of God by believing in the gospel. The fate of them is now described in verses 13 and 14. As for us, you have the apostles' ministry. We can't help to, th to thank God for you. Uh, and so the connection between uh, the mission that Paul, Silas, and Timothy were sent on, the connection with the Thessalonians, they got it. They're living it. They're, they're growing in it. And Paul is thanking God. Uh, Dear brothers and sisters, notice they're loved by the Lord in verse 13. We are always thankful that God shows you to be among the first to experience salvation. Okay, now this should again uh, trigger something that if you've been following First and Second Thessalonians, you understand. Uh, remember in First Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul thanked God that he chose the Thessalonians. How did he know? He knew because Paul and Silas and Timothy came and called them with the gospel and they responded to the gospel and Paul knew they were chosen. Okay, he knew inside of them that God was working. He was drawing them to himself, drawing them to Jesus, immersing them in the, in the words of Jesus, immersing them in the truth of Jesus. And Paul could say, see uh, that they were chosen people. So he thanked God for that. And now here again, Paul says, uh, we are always thankful that God shows you to be among the first to experience salvation. And then he says, it's a salvation that came through the Spirit who makes you holy, uh, H-O-L-Y, and through your belief in the truth, belief and trust in the gospel. So it's all there being repeated, being said again in a concise together statement that's totally consistent with the rest of the teachings of First and Second Thessalonians, that Paul now is acknowledging the work of the gospel among the people of the Thessalonians who are the first to experience salvation among the Gentiles, some of the first group of believers who, who Paul went out to to reach, having been authorized by God to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. And then in, uh, in verse 14, more of the same. He called you to salvation when we told you the good news. Now you can share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of how this ends. Remember, sharing in the glory of Jesus Christ is not just a runner's high, but you find out when Jesus comes back that he's transformed you, that you're not flesh and, and blood and corrupt anymore, that when you meet him in the air, you are now transformed. You're now immortal. You're now in a perfect body at, that's totally obedient to God and has no rebellion or effects of rebellion in you at all. And others can see it. You appear with Jesus as one of his own and you glorify Christ because you share in his glory. You are transformed. It's a beautiful and a sweeping uh, gathering together of all of the concepts of salvation together at the coming of Jesus, the second coming of Christ, and your participation in it as believers in the gospel. So um, I, I hope that you can uh, understand uh, that these verses are here as the highlight of what Paul what Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians is. He's, he's got more to say. He's got some last minute instructions. He's going to give them some exhortations and some uh, earthly and heavenly advice after this. But this is the heart of what he's trying to tell them. And this is the heart of what, uh, what God is trying to tell the Gentiles through Jesus' salvation by the Spirit in bringing the gospel everywhere through human beings. This is the essence of what it means to be saved. Um, I think that in some way that this is uh, probably um, the most important few verses, seven verses in all of Scripture. And I know that's a high and lofty claim, but you have an absolute total uh, theology, anthropology, 
You have ecclesiology here, the study of what it means to be a community of faith and believers. Uh, you have uh, the, the outcome of Jesus' redemption. You have the judgment of God on the fallenness of humanity. Uh, you really have a completely concise statement of everything here in these passages, in these seven verses. Uh, now, I don't expect you to know everything after this, but you know a whole lot if you understand a whole lot of this. You know a whole lot of what, what God is trying to do. And, uh, and so I commend to you verses 8 through 14. Uh, they are taken together as a unit to explain to us the magnificent blessing of God's visitation in Christ. Uh, they explain to us why it's so important that we hear the gospel and welcome it and receive it and then let it change us and live by it, put our hope in it and let it deliver us from evil around us. It's not a religion. It's a work of God. It's the, it's the working of God that's mocked in the workings of the Antichrist. It's the working of God that's fulfilled in the second coming of Christ, in the presence of God. It's the, it's the working that connects us with Him eternally, forever. It's the working of God that does away with our sins. It completely restores us to a state that humanity had before the fall of man, but even better, redeemed now and knowing and, and uh, being connected closer to Christ Himself. There's a lot here in this passage. And I would like to... Um, uh, commend to you this morning that if, if you felt like an earthworm recently, if you felt like, hey, I'm crawling across uh, concrete here, I've, I'm drying up. I don't have excitement. I don't have energy. I feel like things are getting so busy. I'm just going to, I'm just going to lay down, do my final twist and die here and dry up on this concrete. If you feel like that, if you feel like you've been overwhelmed, then uh, I want to encourage you. I'm trying to pick you up this morning and throw you into this soil. This is where the wormhole is. Go here. Learn these passages. Learn the meanings of these passages. Call on the Lord out of this, along with the rest of us who are, who are pulling together in the gospel, who are trusting that this is all we need. We don't need an elaborate religion. We don't need the validation of other religious people. We don't need institutions around us beyond what God would choose to bless us with. We can follow the light of Jesus Christ in the gospel. And we can find that wormhole where we can be bringing nutrients to the people who live here on the, on the planet Earth who are lost in a lost condition. We can bring them nutrients that will hopefully cause them to hear the same gospel and be saved. But we've got to be saved by it first. And then being saved by it first, we'll end up glorifying Jesus Christ as we share in His glory. Would you pray with me? Father, I don't know how to do a better job with this passage of Scripture. Uh, it's completely beyond uh, my pay grade. <laughs> and, uh, and yet I know that your Spirit here uh, can make this happen. I know that as, as the triune God's energy found in verses 13 and 14... The Father, Son, and the Spirit working through the human agency of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the gospel appearing through the ministry of the apostles. I know that that can save us all, that this message can converge with the message of the gospel and they be one and the same, bringing us the same hope and the same deliverance. And that's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may God bless you this week with a new excitement in your life. I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ himself would show you the hope that you have by living anchored in him, the stability that you have in a busy, hectic, confusing world full of lies is so strong that that anchor will hold and you can go in and out of Jesus' presence and live in this tumultuous environment, living here on top of it all, blessed in your own existence and blessing others through it. In Christ's name, amen.